Welcome back everyone to History of Mathematics. We are going to continue our work through Stuart Hollingdale's book, Makers of Mathematics. And we are going to go and hit chapter 10, I believe. Let me make sure I've got that right. Yeah, chapter 10. And this is about Newton's circle. Okay, so the overview is we're going to talk about the work of the mathematicians surrounding Isaac Newton, in particular John Wallace, who was the prominent mathematician in England the generation before Newton. We'll talk about Isaac Barrow, who is basically Newton's teacher. We'll also talk about Edmund Halley, uh, not really a mathematician, famous for other reasons, but he was instrumental in getting Isaac Newton to publish the Principia. And we'll also talk about Roger Coates. So we're going to go ahead and get started with the work of John Wallace. So let me take a sec and switch to the document camera here. So talking about the work of John Wallace here. So prominent English mathematician in the generation right before Isaac Newton. He uh, was eventually a friend and confidant of Isaac Newton. Now, we had talked about the introduction of algebraic symbolism using letters to stand for variables and things like that, going all the way back to Francois Viette a few centuries before this. However, Viette didn't really use algebraic symbolism in the way that we use it today. And John Wallace is the first recorded individual to write things the way we would write them. This is actually something we'll go over in a later video. There's a, a more accessible way to prove this later on. But this is an infinite product formula for pi that John Wallace was able to derive. And it's, uh, it's very elegant. You'll notice the numerator has only the uh, evens and the denominator has exclusively the odds. Uh, of course, this is an infinite product here. It continues forever in the sense that the more terms you take, the better the approximation you get to pi over two. So what I want to talk about in this video is Wallace's approach to quadrature or finding areas. So let me kind of scoop this up a little bit here. So we're looking at Wallace's work on quadrature. Okay, so remember quadrature is about finding the area of something. So let's just go with a very simple case here. We're going the area under y equals x from x equals 0 to x equals a. Now, of course, this is a triangle. So, based on elementary geometry, we can see that the area of that triangle should be one half of the area of the square region. In other words, that's saying that the integral from 0 to a of x dx should be one half a squared, because the area of the square is a squared, and the area of the triangle should be one half of that. But what I really wanted to talk about was how Wallace is getting this formula right here. So in other words, I am looking here on page 231 of our book, and the author is talking about Wallace considering this ratio. So I want to talk about how he gets to that, and you can understand it pretty easily if you understand our modern notion of finding a definite integral. So let's go over here and look at that here. So how, how is the work of finding the area under the curve related to this right here? Okay, well, if we look at our modern procedure, basically taking a Riemann sum, okay, so we would approximate that with rectangles. And we were talking about, remember, the interval 
that we were working with was 0 to a. Okay, so we would break that up into n pieces. Each of them would have width a over n, right? It would depend on what n is. So the heights of the rectangles are going to be evaluated by plugging the x values into the function. And the uh, bases of the rectangles uh, would be this right here. Okay, so uh, I think I actually need these to be A's here. I think it all comes out in the wash in the end. But um, the area of the square here, I'm just going to look at the strips. Okay. So the heights would all be the same there. Go ahead and make these all A's, A. All right. So um, I'm a little, little happier with that right now. Okay, so the width is A over N for each rectangle. The first rectangle you would evaluate at the first endpoint and the second rectangle at the second endpoint and so on to get the various heights. Multiply by the width, add them all up, and you get the area or an approximation to the area under the curve. And this is maybe not the most convenient way to do it, but this is the area of the square. Okay, and I would of course note that here we have n terms. Okay. And I would note also that everything has a factor of a squared. So if we look at the ratio of the areas, I'm going to go ahead and make a little correction here and square all of my a's. Okay. The ratio of the areas, which is what Wallace was looking at, would be this right here. Okay, now you'll notice this is a so-called complex fraction. It's a fraction with a fraction in the numerator and the denominator. And there's a really convenient way to clear that. What you do is you multiply everything by the LCD. In fact, I'm going to multiply the top and bottom of this by n squared over a squared. Now, as long as I do the same thing to the top and bottom, I am not changing the value of the fraction. Okay. So what I would do, of course, is distribute. This would become a 1, a 2, a 3, all the way up to an n. The n squared and the a squared would cancel. Down here, Down here in the denominator, I would get a bunch of n's. Okay, so if we think about our typical procedure for doing a Riemann sum, and then look at how that would relate to the area of the square in that picture that we saw a second ago, we would actually get led to this right here. Okay, so the question becomes, what is, what is this right here? Because the denominator can be simplified quite a bit. There was n terms, and each of the terms is n, so the denominator simplifies to n squared. The question is, what does the numerator simplify to? Now, if you look back, you might remember there's a, a way to establish a closed form expression for this right here. So I claim that that numerator is n times n plus 1 divided by 2. If we wanted to prove that, 
we could do so using mathematical induction. Okay, so I'll just write it on the side here. What I just claimed was that 1 plus 2 plus 3 and continue in that way until we get to n is equal to n times n plus 1 divided by 2 for all natural numbers n. Okay, now <clears throat> this simplifies quite a bit right here. Right, I could kind of rewrite this. as such. Okay, so I just uh, broke the fraction up there. The In the first one, the factors of n squared cancel. In the second one, I have an n in the denominator. And then we can see as n goes to infinity, this approaches one half. Thus, that would establish John Wallace's claim that the area of the triangle is one-half the area of the related square. Okay, now, of course, the reason he was doing this was not to find the area of a triangle. We could have done that just using the elementary geometry would have been done with the problem right there. The reason he did that is he wanted to generalize this not just the area under y equals x, but the area under y equals x power m for any value of m. And he ends up doing a similar technique right here. So if we go back to the text a sec, and we look at this, okay, you can see that what Wallace is wanting to do is, okay, for when we deal with squares, when we deal with y equals x squared, let's say, we're going to end up with this type of expression. And Wallace claims that this type of ex this expression here on the left is equal to this expression over here on the right. So the area under the curve y equals x squared from x equals 0 to x equals a is one-third of the associated area of the rectangle. Okay, so this business here about looking at these ratios is about generalizing this process. 